it's great to be back here, and I, I love both this conference and what New America is trying to do. I love a culture of new ideas. Um, and you know what we've been focusing on in this is really about towns, cities, and innovative ideas to solve a lot of the problems that, that we have floating around in the country. Um, I have been friends with uh, Governor Kasich for a number of years, and he's really impressive at every level. Um, you know, he was a member of Congress for 18 years. He did that for a while. He went to Wall Street. Uh, he's done a lot of banking. He understands finance extremely well. Um, he pushed very, very hard for balanced budgets, proper fiscal, all the things that we never hear here in Washington. And what's interesting, of course, is he's written, even though he's, he's also an idea generator, he's written three different best-selling books, right, on the ideas. So he's not only a political force of significant energy, but he's also a person who generated a lot of new ideas, which I've actually enjoyed lear learning about. And it's a, sort of a testament that, that his ideas and some of the ideas I've heard yesterday and today are not that dissimilar. You know, what's interesting is that in Ohio, he has become, I think, probably the most popular governor in Ohio in its, I don't know, many, many decades. He's essentially carries every county. Um, and part of the reason his message works is that he managed to balance the sort of tensions between the traditional parties and various issues. I, I came up with some quotes that I thought, um, I think there's, a, uh, he said, I think there is among both parties, that is both parties, a growing antipathy towards poor people. Can you imagine somebody actually saying that? Um, he also believes, as he said in his inaugural address, economic growth is not an end into itself, and this is a critical point. Um, he, he's also sort of impatient which is, I think, a good quality in a leader. He wants change, and he wants it fairly quickly. He says, impatience with bureaucracy, with partisan posturing, and with ideological purity. You know, let's get back to solving the problems of the country. And I won't give his speech, but I obviously agree, Governor. Um, he's going to be joined um, with, uh, by Gloria Borger, who I think everyone here knows and has uh, been a fantastic, fantastic reporter and covering the national scene for many years. Um, I've worked with the governor, and he's very, very much the kind of leader and politician that we want to see, and he's a rising voice at the national level. Governor and Gloria, would you like to join us? Thank you. Very generous. Thank you. Do you want me to speak okay, I, they want me to say a few things, and uh, you know, I, I sort of wasn't exactly certain what I was going to talk about today, and then I walked in and I see all these young people here, so I'm extremely excited about uh, the energy that's in this room. Uh, maybe you've heard of Google, huh? Uh, well, Eric Schmidt sort of brought tremendous organization to a couple guys who were dreamers. Uh, I'm a dreamer. I hope you're all dreamers, regardless of what age you are, it's, it's important to dream. I want to tell you an interesting story. I, after 9-11, uh, I had suggested to Secretary Rumsfeld that we begin to take the technology that we find in our country to battle the technology that we were seeing literally in the caves in places like Afghanistan that in some sense uh, was more effective than what we had. And uh, I suggested that we take some people from the Silicon Valley into the Pentagon uh, to learn about what they could do to solve some of the, the technical problems that we had. And um, two of the guys uh, who went down there uh, were very, very effective. And I went back to California, and we had a dinner for some of the folks who came and participated. Well, these two guys appeared at this dinner and they drove a Volkswagen with their uh, inline skates tied to the roof of the Volkswagen. That was about a year before they went public, and their names were, of course, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. And uh, a remarkable story of what can happen when you think, think big. So a little bit about, a little bit about entrepreneurship. I never really understood as a, as a kid, because my father was a postman, he carried mail on his back, and I grew up in a very blue-collar town, that you could actually create businesses and have people work for you rather than you work for somebody else. I never understood that. 
until I kind of left there and left college. And I guess I, in a way I was a political entrepreneur, but never understood the other side of it. I, don't, I think what's common to all people who are entrepreneurs and innovators is number one, you, have, you can have no sense of failure, no fear of failure. You've got to be willing to set yourself free. So to the young people who are here, the only thing that represents failure is not trying. I try to tell my 15-year-old daughters that, you know, well, I don't want to do track, Daddy, I might not win. Well, you know, the failure is in not trying, not in the fact that you try and you, you don't win. So you first of all have to be really, you can't be risk adverse to be a great entrepreneur. And if you study all of them, they're just uh, remarkable people who have a great idea and they're not af afraid that people will reject their idea. And the second thing you have to be able to do is you have to be able to, to sell that idea. And sometimes selling that idea takes a lot of time. It's like selling an idea in politics. It's not easy. And I've always said that the key to success in anything is persistence. You don't have to be the smartest person. You just have to be persistent to where you bang on the door for so long that people will go ahead and answer the door just because they want to get rid of you. I mean, I ran for the senior Republican job on the budget committee back in 1993, and I jumped over seven people who were more senior than I was. And the way I got it is over Thanksgiving, I called all the members of the committee that was to make this decision, and most of them weren't at home, but their spouses were at home. And I called over and over and over again, and then what they finally told me is, if you'll stop calling, I will promise you that my husband or my wife will vote for you. And, uh, <laughs> And I ended up winning by one vote to become the senior Republican. So there is a, a need for persistence. And by the way, Eric, I have an idea of an internet company that I keep trying to sell to people, but so far it, it hasn't worked. But uh, don't be surprised if I bang on your door. Thirdly, of course, you need capital. You know, one of the problems we have, Gloria, in the Midwest is we don't have the capital. We can have the ideas, but the capital is not there. And the capital is like the fuel for a jet airplane. If you can't get the capital, you can't take it up off the, off the deck of a carrier or take, lift it off from the field if you don't have that capital. In politics, you don't exactly have capital, but there you have to use human capital and get buy-in. That's what's really critical. And the, one of the big problems that we have in the Midwest when it comes to innovating, and I don't know how many of you are here from the Midwest, is the Midwest, for whatever reason, gets extremely comfortable with the status quo. Change is not something that they get real excited about. And it's reflected in our university structures. If you want to find dynamic change, you can't find most of it, or much of it, in our, in our universities. Now, if you think about why is it there's so much success in the Silicon Valley, why is there so much success on the East Coast? Well, it's real simple, because the universities both out in the West and the universities in the East are very open to promoting entrepreneurship, creating spaces for entrepreneurs to work, and the ability to put together creative partnerships that rewards the idea creator and takes the idea creator with those people who know how to facilitate those ideas into real substance. That's what works. And in my state of Ohio, we find that we can't commercialize. You can't commercialize most of the products out of our universities in most places in the country. Why? Because there's not a culture of innovation. There's not a culture of risk taking. There's not a culture of people getting excited about new ideas. There's not a culture that said, damn the status quo, it's time to move ahead before we die. We don't have that. So what I've been doing lately is I have a doctor from the Cleveland Clinic who I have now authorized to go into all of our public universities in Ohio and find out in the medical field if they have done anything in there that's of value. Because you see in these universities the rules of tenure, which by the way, I don't know if that's a 17th or 18th century philosophy, but the rules of tenure, in my opinion, create the disincentive for people to be risk takers. They gotta go through these widgets, they gotta go you know, track through this process. It's like running a, you know, a mouse through some sort of a maze. They have to keep going through this. And so if you say to them, why don't we be creative? They're like, what are you kidding? I have to get tenure. And I got to publish or, 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 or I will perish. So what we're trying to do in my state and what the entire Midwest and what the ent entire university community ought to do 
is figure out how to get on the program because these are extremely valuable institutions that frankly are not providing the public with the value that they could if we could free them. By the way, same is true with K through 12 education where we still embrace an agrarian model where we stick every kid in a classroom and teach them all the same way even though we know in the 21st century everybody learns differently. Some people learn by written instructions, other people learn by verbal instructions, other people learn uh, through actually visual instruction. You know, take my golf game. I do better when somebody shows me how to swing than if I read some book trying to figure out how to make it work. But yet the agrarian model resides in our country and I think it's keeping us from unleashing the incredible human potential we have in America driven primarily by young people with great ideas who are dreamers. Now, let me tell you a little bit about government risk-taking because we've been, I think, really entrepreneurial. Let me tell you a couple of the things that we've done in Ohio. I have privatized economic development. We no longer do economic development in the bureaucracy of my state. Now, this was a concept that people had a very hard time understanding. In fact, they still attack me for it. Eric, here's what we did. We created a not-for-profit entity. We issued debt. And through the issuing of that debt, we had the dollars for this not-for-profit entity to buy Ohio's liquor program. And we know, and we use the proceeds from the liquor program to pay off the bonds, plus it gives us about $100 million plus for economic development. The only risk to the bonds is if people stop drinking. And what I figured out is, you know, in good times they drink, and in bad times they drink more. So, so we have now this thing called Jobs Ohio. Now, who have we filled it with? We've actually filled it with people that actually understand business. We have, uh, for example, a guy who runs Jobs Ohio who's a, a financial, uh, 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 you know, financial services uh, expert. I mean, he can sit down with Jamie Dimon and talk about anything in the area of, of, um, of banking. The same is true with the insurance industry. He knows all these things. We have an expert in energy. You know, Ohio's on the forefront of the shale gas revolution. We just were able to locate a foreign entity, both PTT and Marabeni, to build a cracker facility in our state. They're in the early stages of doing that because we have energy experts. We have people who are experts in health care. So in other words, we have people in this entity who are not civil servants, who can get paid a little bit more money, who get young people excited about being involved in changing the world, and that's exactly what we're doing. So in Ohio, we are now up 340,000 jobs. We were down 350,000 before I came in. But the key now is we're diversifying the business uh, uh, of Ohio. You think about Ohio, you think cows, agriculture, steel. Okay? We got all that. But now we have cloud computing and we're becoming very robust. Financial services is no longer what we saw in a Jimmy Stewart movie. You all know financial services. Now we're worried about being hacked. We are experts now, growing, growing experts in the medical, uh, medical field, including medical devices. Um, we are diversifying Ohio. Energy, advanced energy, plastics, polymers, all those things. See, Ohio is changing its face because we have now figured out how to target the industries of the 21st century, coupling them with the industries that have been traditional, a part of Ohio's DNA. Uh, they didn't want to do this. The, the, this was very, very hard to sell. Why did I do it? They don't like me, I, I'd be disappointed, but it's not going to keep me from trying, so we got it done. Secondly, our turnpike. Now you're going to say, what does that have to do with anything? We have a road that, that goes from the entire, entire north of Ohio. I found out that people were actually married to their spouses and married to this road. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. There should be laws against this. Our turnpike is like an independent country. It was applying for membership in the United Nations. Nobody controlled anything. The road was falling apart, and it had great value. So I came out and said, you know what? This is really not smart. We should extract the value from our turnpike and use it to advance our infrastructure. And people went absolutely crazy. The Cleveland Plain Dealer wrote that this was the end of John Kasich, which wouldn't have been bad. I could have worked on my golf game. But, uh, so we went out and we told the people what we were going to do. So guess what we did? 
We went out again, issued debt. We retire the debt from the tolls that are paid on the turnpike. And people who live and use the turnpike all the time are held harmless. And it produced a billion dollars in extra revenue. And Ohio has the most robust road construction infrastructure program in Ohio history. Now, people didn't want to do this. But you know, I don't have the fear of somebody's going to yell or polls or focus groups. or So that's entrepreneurship in the government. We privatized at least one of our prisons. Then when we privatized it and the people that owned the prison didn't produce, we went up and beat the living daylights out of them until they became quality. So sometimes you have to stay on top of things. The straight A fund, we put $100 million into K through 12 education to get the schools to, to do things that were innovative and different, where they could save money but at the same time improve education. This program has been enormously successful. And to give you one example, we brought all these folks who have been recipients of this straight A fund innovation grants to the Capitol. And I had a 10-year-old girl walk up to me, along with an 11 and 12-year-old, and they're tugging on my coat. And they say, Mr. Governor, would you come over and take a look at the, th at the uh, 3D printing machine that we built? Now, I got a 10-year-old girl talking to me about 3D printing that she built. Is that, if that's not exciting, I don't know what is, because we're unleashing her potential. She'll probably build a better search engine someday. I don't know, Eric, if that can be done. Um, payment reform. Here's what we're doing now. You'll find this interesting. I gave a couple million dollars to our children's hospitals to work together. To work together, that was the condition. You work together to solve a problem. They took up two issues. One is treating child asthma, keeping kids out of the hospital. Secondly, dealing with the problem of drug-infected babies. Do you know how many babies end up in our hospitals? who were born addicted to drugs. It's, what a horrible situation. But anyway, on the asthma side, the children's hospitals came together and figured out a way to change the protocols to keep children healthy without having to go into the hospital. Well, when they don't go in the hospital, the hospital gets less revenue. But the insurance company has larger profits. So guess what? We've struck a deal where the insurance companies and the providers share the benefits. That's the key to health care in America. The key to health care in America is to keep people healthy and get all the people involved in the stream to say, if we keep people healthy, there's savings. And with those savings come the benefit of everybody to gain. Everybody can win. It's a win-win. Plus, us, the patient, we're healthier. And that involves transparency. You know, you're a lot more likely to ask your rabbi or your minister what they get paid a year than you are willing to find out what it costs for a medical procedure today. But we believe there's a way to get this done. And if the people don't want to cooperate, we'll put the pressure on them to get them to cooperate. You see, what it gets down to is no fear. Now, in the private sector, here's the thing you need to know. If you have, if you have 10 investments, and one of them happens to be Facebook, you're a king or a queen in the private sector world. If you're in government and you, and you have nine successes and one failure, you're a bum. Because what the media will focus on is your failure. They will never talk about your success. So in order to be entrepreneurial in the government, you can't worry about popularity. You just gotta worry about fixing things and getting things together. Now finally, before Gloria comes up here, centralization in most cases is not good. Let me tell you about this town. We found out one day that we thought we had a nurse who had Ebola. Uh, panic hit the, my staff. I went down to the, to the office and said, look, everybody stay calm. Called the head of HHS. I got voicemail, modern invention. I then called the head of the CDC, and I got voicemail. So finally, and I'm in the middle of a crisis, right? I'm getting voicemail. So finally, the, the head of HHS, who's a lovely lady, says, uh, calls me back and says, wow, what's going on? What can we do for you? I said, could you call the guy at CDC and ask him to phone me? So about a half an hour later, the phone rings. It's the guy. He says, well, what can I do for you? I said, two things. One is I need somebody who's a contact expert. 
I need to know who this nurse may have touched in her stay in Akron so we can figure out how to isolate people and treat them appropriately. And uh, secondly, I need your team to come out here and get on the ground and start helping us. This is about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. At 7 o'clock, I'm in a meeting, and I turn to my staff. I said, how's the CDC team? What time are they getting here? They said, well, they're in Atlanta, and they don't know how to get a flight to Columbus, Ohio, so they're thinking about coming tomorrow. So we sent an airplane and picked them up and brought them into Ohio. Is that what we expect out of our federal government? If you want it, you know, it used to be when you wanted to go visit the White House, you had to get a pass. Now you just jump over the fence. I mean, we've got a Veterans Administration that's not functioning. And this is not, this is not political or partisan, this is just the facts. And you take on top of that the fighting that goes on between both parties on all these issues. That's why there are more 18-year-olds that believe they'll see a UFO than a Social Security check. So what is the answer here? The answer is to go back and reinvent the way this whole government functions. The federal government ought to be strong where it needs to be strong. National defense, protecting our borders. I mean, we can talk about a lot of these National Institutes of Health, which Newt is asking to double the budgets, which I agree with. But then on so many other programs, job training, poverty, welfare, these are programs that we can manage far better at the state level because the founders wanted us to be, wanted us to be laboratories of, 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 of change, laboratories of trying. We know in that environment some will fail, but I'm a lot better at figuring out how to train the workforce in Ohio than somebody who lives in Washington who calls me up and says, what time is it in Ohio? We're actually in the same, by the, by the way, we're in the same time zone, but they don't know that. We have a welfare system that throws dad out of the uh, home. How dumb is that? Let dad stay in the home and make a few more bucks. We have a welfare program that says that if mom gets a promotion, she loses her child care. So mom can't take a promotion. I mean, how dumb is that? So there's so many things that can be fixed at the state level if the federal government establishes goals or begins to trust the states, recognizing that some states are going to fail. And when some states fail, people can move. They can go somewhere else to live. And at the same time, we can come up with more creative and innovative ideas for our country. And I'll tell you one final thing. We can renew your interest in solving problems. Don't leave it to somebody else. Don't leave it to somebody in the government. Engage. That's how you change the world. You don't change the world by having to hit a grand slam home run, hit a home run with all the runners on base. Why don't you just get a single, get on base, Ch make a change, change one life. That's what some of what we've lost in this country. And young people, you folks, you're the ones that we got to count on to burn the flame brighter. Because we can be fantastic as a country. But right now we're losing our way. And we really have to bring it back. Because whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, a liberal, or a conservative, we're Americans before anything else. Embrace the change, have no fear, have courage, life is short, and have no regrets. How's that? That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Can they ask questions out here, too, at some point? I mean, if they want to. I mean, oh, sure. I can I mean, do it anyway. I no, no, I want you to ask questions, but let the crowd have a couple okay. of things to say, right? Thank you all. No uh, borders. Right. Actually, we can do it any way you want, any way you guys, you guys want. So let me uh, thank you for your illuminating remarks. Were they which okay? got a little political, I thought, at the Did end. They? But we're going to get a little more political. Okay. Well, I don't, what was political about those remarks? Nothing, nothing. So, well, what do you mean nothing? Come on. <laughs> no, I mean, call it. No. So thank you for being here. Thank yes. you for doing this. Uh, let me start with a question that uh, you didn't ask yourself there, but I'm going to ask you because I have to. Uh, are you running for oh, president? Oh, this is such a boring question. <laughs> it's not a boring question. Would yeah. anybody here think I ought to try to think about this and explore it? What do you think, huh? Please clap or you're going to embarrass me, huh? I mean, come on. Okay, so, Gloria, uh, I've now taken the next step. And um, so we formed a political organization. I'm going to raise money into it. I've been traveling, as you know. Mm -hmm. You and I have been together. I'm going to continue to travel continue to tell people what's on my mind, see if I can get the resources to go 
you know, into the primaries. And um, I'm not going to change my message. I'm not going into suck up or any of that other stuff. Well, maybe a little bit at some point, but I'm going to try <laughs> to avoid it. And um, if I can win, I'm likely to run. But I got to see how if I can. How do you work that through? How do you work, well, do I mean, you work through that decision as you? Well, nine, nine elections for Congress, one into the state Senate, and two for governor. I think I can figure this out. And my folks. So we're just, we, we can figure out whether it's working. And we can figure out if it's not working. Um, because I can see where it's working with people who are already out there. And you know, when people say, well, you need to declare for president, what's the difference between declaring and not declaring? As long as you, you're building the, the, the structure and you're out there getting the resources, what difference does it make? Just a nice week with the media? I mean, that's not that important to me. Well, I'll decide this when I want to decide it when I think it can happen. Um, because, let me tell you why. Anybody in this room that wants to be president, you should try think about running someday. Have big dreams. For me, um, I have to put my family, my friends at risk. And I'm not going to put them at risk if I don't think we can have success. And just traveling around and running for president, that's, that's not the most important thing in the world. So if I can win, you're likely to see it. If I can't win, I'll tell you what I thought I fell short on. Is, is there anything at this point, though, that you see out there? Because you've been traveling. Yeah, been that's why I'm moving forward. That would, that yeah, that's why I'm moving forward. I'm move, I created this 527 political organization. And if I didn't think that it was working, I wouldn't have done that. I would have just said, forget it. Okay. So, no, I think it is improving, but it's a long way to go. I mean, just a couple trips doesn't prove anything for anybody, no matter who they are. Let's, let's broaden this out. Uh, but, but, but here's the other thing I tell you. I think I'm entitled to do this. Let me, t you know, I was 18 years in Congress, chairman of the Budget Committee, was the chief architect of the 97 agreement that balanced the budget, paid down the largest amount of publicly held debt in the modern era. I was on the Armed Services Committee, a defense guy, for 18 years. Right. I've been governor of Ohio two terms. In the last election, I won 86 out of 88 counties. I got 26% of the African American vote, 60% of the women, and 51% uh, and, and of blue collar households. And I, I run Ohio, which is a microcosm of America. I think I should be okay about being able to get out and tell people what I think. I'm glad to be here today to talk about these issues, because maybe somebody heard something here today that'll make a difference in their life. Where, where do you fit on the Republican spectrum? You see uh, more you, than a dozen candidates already lining up. Yeah. Where, what, what is the John Kasich brand in that, in that lineup yeah. of candidates we see? Where, where, well, Gloria, where are first you? of all, you know, I'm the most experienced of all of them. No, I am. I have the results. I'm not talking about what I'm going to do. You know, I had a meeting with African Americans with the Colin Post in Cleveland, and they said, well, we want to know what you want to do. I said, forget about what I want to do. Let's talk about what I've done. I mean, when you balance the federal budget for the first time since man walked on the moon, when, you, when you've traveled the world dealing with, uh, with national security issues, when you take a state that's lost 350,000 jobs, I inherit an $8 billion deficit, and we're going down the drain, and we turn that around, I mean, who else has done all that? Who understands how a legislator becomes embittered about an executive? Because we all do when we're legislators. As an executive, who better understands how to bring legislators together? I mean, we, we got people traveling all over the world getting foreign policy experience. You know, we used to joke that, um, that Bill Clinton got his foreign policy experience at the International House of Pancakes. But, um, but the fact is, is that for me, this is a life I lived. So I don't have to go traveling anywhere to try to figure out what I think about these issues. So it's experience. And secondly, you know, the problem I have with the media is a guy with the Washington Post said yesterday, you're an enigma. You know, you're, you're helping the poor people to rise. You heard what Eric Schmidt said about some of the things I've said. You know, economic growth's not an end unto itself. Why is that? If you're growing stronger, then you need to help the drug addicted to get on their feet. You need to help the mentally ill and get them out of our prisons. We got more mentally ill people in our prisons than we have in psychiatric hospitals. That's a disgrace. We got to help the working poor to get health care so they're not spending all their time in the emergency room sicker and more costly. So people say, well, you're an enigma. I don't know where you're going to come down. Why don't, you know, what's the script you follow? I don't follow any script. And you know this. You've covered me for 25 years. So you all figure out where I fit on the spectrum. That was an answer to the question. Um, <laughs> 
you, you've been here talking about what you've done in Ohio. Uh, we all know that you won re-election there with impressive right. numbers. 64% of the vote, 60% of women voted for you, 26% uh, of minorities. On, on paper, that's presidential goal, particularly when you come from a state like Ohio, which no Republican has ever won the presidency without winning the state of Ohio, which I don't have to tell you. But you do drive conservatives crazy because you have accepted the president's Medicaid money. They think that means you're for big government. Rand Paul said that those governors who no. accepted that money um, think that, quote, money grows on trees. What's your answer to Rand Paul? Well, I'm, I'm going to answer. Rand, he's a good man. He's running for president. God bless him. But I think I have a right to define conservatism. Is conservatism locking the mentally ill in a prison then they get out, and they're bipolar, and they assault a police officer, and they're back in prison. Is that conservative? By the way, it's $22,500 a year in Ohio if you're in prison. How about the drug addicted? What we do is we lock them in prison, and then they come out, and they meet the drug dealer on the corner. And they either overdose or they're back in prison. Or the, or the working poor who don't get health care, they can't afford it, so they're in the emergency rooms. And we all pay for that. Now, is that conservative? If that's conservative, then I, don't, I think it better change. So my goal is to take these folks and get our money back from Washington, $14 billion, to help our local communities to deal with these folks. So what do, what's our record now? We're now putting people who are fighting, who are helping people to get off drugs in the prison. I mean experts. And we're handing them off into the community so that they don't get back on drugs again. We believe our recidivism rate will be as low as 10%. Our recidivism rate in our prisons is 27% as opposed to 50% national average. Why? Because we give people uh, the, the, the incentive to work their way out of prison, to get a skill, to get a job, to get in the community, to be with their families. I mean, this is, you were bet you're a gangbanger? We're going to lock you up and throw away the key. Okay, so, so, so here's what I'm saying, Gloria. Giving people comprehensive health care and then holding them accountable, getting people off of welfare, training them for programs that get them independent, helping the mentally ill to get their lives back and keep on their medication, taking the drug addicted and giving them a chance to, um, to be able to, to live normal lives, that to me is conservatism. Because you know what? Um, we're all created for a certain reason and a certain purpose. And helping people to find that purpose is conservative. And you know what? Probably Ronald Reagan would have agreed with me before we changed the caricature of who he is. Well, last time you and I spoke, you said that someone extreme, that was your word, would not be able to win in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, does that apply to candidates you see in this race? I'm not going to criticize candidates in this race. And let me tell you why. I I'm going to, uh, and let me, t no, no, I mean, at least I'm not going to do it at this point, okay? Um, <laughs> When somebody's running, give them some oxygen, okay? But here's what my message is. You think you're going to win Ohio by being a divider? You're wrong. People in Ohio, look, we're a microcosm. We're blue collar, we're minorities, we're, we're urban, we're suburban, we're rural. My first year, I was involved in a lot of divisive issues. My approval rating was 28%. You have to work to do that poorly, okay? Now my approval rating is, you know, it'll change, but it was like 61% the last time I checked. Why? Giving everybody a, a chance that they could be lifted. Giving everybody a chance that they can be, they can be something special. But you're for Common Core. Well, wait a minute. And okay, let's talk about that. And a pathway to citizenship. Okay, wait, 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 let me answer them. We believe in high education standards set by local school boards. Now, you know, I, I talked to Bill Bennett the other day, and he said, well, I don't know, you know, I was on a show, and I said, I don't, I don't know, why would anybody be against high standards set with a curriculum by, by the local school boards? And by the way, some of the people who are opposed to this idea now wrote the thing. I didn't write it. And in, and in my state, I don't set the standards. Obama doesn't set the standards, the president. Local people set the standards. Now, if there's something wrong with that, I'd like to know what it is. And here's why they put this together. Because they knew that there were children in some states that were not getting the tools and skills they needed to compete with people in other states and to compete in the international marketplace. 
Thank goodness we're driving high standards now. Now, the path to immig for immigration. We've got 12 million people living here illegally. I don't like that they ditched the line. I've got friends who are bitter that they ditched the line who stood in line, okay? We don't have enough school buses to load all these people on, drive them to the border, open the door, and shout, get out, okay? We can't do that. So we've got to come together. I don't like the idea of citizenship. I don't like that, but I said I wouldn't take it off the table. You don't get into a tough negotiation without having people sit and say, what's doable here? Um, and so I think it's impractical to say we're going to send them all home. The reason why I don't, I, I'm not enamored with the path of citizenship is I don't want somebody ditching the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got the Stones coming to Columbus. You know, I don't want somebody getting in front of me and getting the tickets and I, I can't go. I you were a deadhead, no? no? Well, I'm a lot of different things. Yeah. Well, you can't pin me down on that one either. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's killing me that I'm not going to see Lincoln Park the um, uh, next couple of weeks. <laughs> and there's Halpern out there. He's put me through the music gauntlet, and I think I did okay. Um, okay, yeah. so wait. I got, I got nine yeah, minutes left, yeah. so let me, let me we can move run over quickly a little through bit. the world here. Um, <laughs> Farm policy, yeah. you were talking about your experience on the Armed Services Committee right. for 18 years, called yourself the most experienced uh, Republican. Yesterday, uh, we had the news here that, that uh, drones apparently killed two Westerners, uh, and the president uh, came out, spoke to the American public, admitted it was an error. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, the, this drone program, the lethal drone program of yesterday was run by the CIA. They are not the targeting experts. I mean, the experts in targeting are the Pentagon, the Air Force. They figure out how to look at targets, and the CIA is supposed to give us the intelligence to figure out whether the targeting makes sense. So I would not want to get rid of a drone program, and I'll tell you why. Sometimes that drone will save us from having to put somebody into Tora Bora who we bring home in a box, who's our soldier. Now, but the drone program can't be used haphazardly or casually, and it can't be, I don't believe it should be run by the CIA. I think it should be run inside of the Pentagon where they are experts in targeting. And the use of this program, I mean, this is very, very serious. Collateral, somebody said, you know, collateral damage happens. Well, I was involved, I was telling Eric, I was involved with Bono in the late 90s trying to get debt relief, why? Because I said that if we can help countries around Africa, that when a B-2 bomber flies over the village and people are shaking their fists, women can say, but they, but they vaccinated my kid. When you have collateral damage, you've now infuriated and lost a whole group of people who might not naturally be your enemies. They could be your supporters. So that's why the use of these drones is, and, and the, the expertise behind them is so absolutely critical. So I would not have it in the CIA. I would have it located in the Pentagon. I'd use CIA intelligence, and I'd be extremely careful when I used it. But there probably are times when we can take out, here's the other problem. You have these, these, other, these other weapons that you know, carried in the submarines. By the time you launch, you're 13 hours later. You know, these people move, they're mobile. So sometimes you want to use those drones, but you've got to be extremely careful. Do you think it was a mis could have been an intelligence mistake? You know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, it's easy to point and, you mm -hmm. know, I, I don't know. But I think that program needs to be closely reviewed. And again, it should not be operated, in my judgment, by the CIA. You also uh, said to me uh, a few weeks ago when we met that uh, you would not root out boots on the ground to stop ISIS. Mm -hmm. And you well, said you'd rather deal with it sooner rather than later. Right. Well, I think there's two sets of relationships that need to be reconstructed. The first one is with our friends in Europe who hold our values, the Western ethic, the Germans, the French, the Brits, the Spanish, the Italians, and others East in Central Europe, because I think those relationships have eroded. You can see that when we can't figure out how to put decent sanctions on, on Putin as he gobbles up more and more territory. We, those relationships need to be rebuilt, and they are not strong, and you think about what happens when that Western ethic gets eroded? Then, then secondly, Gloria, the other group that needs to be rebuilt is the, are the Republicans and the Democrats in the Congress who don't like one another. That might be harder to rebuild than our relations with these foreign leaders, to tell you the truth, that they all need to be rebuilt. What I suggested is, whether it's the Jordanians, the Egyptians, 
our friends in Europe, we need to confront ISIS. And America should be involved. And if that includes boots on the ground, fine. But we shouldn't be nation builders. I don't believe in all this nation building. I don't believe in getting in the middle of civil wars. I voted against US troops in Lebanon. I did not favor American intervention in Bosnia. It doesn't mean we can't be impactful in those areas, but we don't have to put our people there. It's like in Syria. We should have been in early, arming those people who were opposed to, to Assad. We didn't do it. We blew it. And our foreign policy has been a shambles. And by the way, when you get to Iran, what we're doing, we're going to give them the ability to produce a nuke and hope they change in 10 years. I mean, th that just doesn't make sense. So, so I take it you would not vote for this? Uh, not the way it is now. I, you look Even at, in phases, if... if, if uh, well, you know, the last thing I read was the Ayatollah said we need to lift sanctions immediately, and then I see the administration saying, well, maybe we can figure that out. Sometimes you fall in love with a deal. You know, sometimes you want something so badly that you end up agreeing to something that you learn to regret. And we see what's happening in North Korea now, where we thought we had this great deal. I mean, they're supplying technology, missile parts to, uh, to Iran. I mean, this is, let me tell you, this issue of the proliferation of not only these weapons, but this material. How would you, would you think about somebody like Hamas or Hezbollah or somebody from some group like, like ISIS and the potential of a dirty bomb? Now, that's not going to be a weapon of mass destruction, but it's going to be mass destruction for those that are affected, and you could have many, many people that would die in that. The, the, the proliferation of this material, you mark my words, now in Asia they're beginning to talk about these countries building a nuclear capability because they're now saying North Korea has a nuclear arsenal. You think about what they're saying in the Middle East now where the Saudis and, and other, other countries are beginning to talk about creating nuclear weapons. Is everybody going to have nuclear weapons in the world? What do you think is going to happen? This is serious business about mankind. This is not some political discussion. And I want to have a deal, and I'm going to trust. This is about my 15-year-old daughters and their survival. And we got to be careful here what we do. You think the White House fell in love with a deal? I the think they have the fallen in love with this deal, and they're running as fast as they can to get it done, and I hope they back off. I, I am not here to demonize the president. I'm not here to demonize anybody. They better realize what they're doing here. And we can all fall in love with a deal, and they got to hear other people that say, be careful, Schultz. Kissinger, these are the, these are the, you know, the, the, the wise men, okay? Well, I don't just listen to wise men, but look at all the people who are critiquing this. Look at the concern around the world about this. And, but, the, but to have a deal predicated on, the, first of all, we don't, they say we're going to have inspections, but we can't inspect military facilities. Well, we want massive inspection, but we don't know if we can get that. I mean, there's no agreement between the United States and Iran on what they signed. So how are you supposed to say we're going to be for an agreement that nobody can agree what the agreement is, Gloria? Hillary Clinton seems to be saying that it might be a, it's a good first step. Well, you know what? Look, politics, unfortunately, enters into a lot of this. It just is unfortunate. I remember when I voted against U.S. troops in Lebanon, I had Tip O'Neill poking me in the chest saying, I remember when men got elected to this body, and I remember Jack Kemp coming down on the floor of the House and yelling at me about why I'm not supporting U.S. troops in Lebanon. I don't care about that. I got to use, I got to talk to smart people. I got to think about how I feel about something and make a decision without regard to whether I want to win a political campaign. Haven't we had enough of all this? We've had a, too much of this, of this politics and polls and focus groups and, you know, we can get away from that stuff. Be normal. You know, so when she says this, I don't know, she say because she believes it or she's running for president. I don't know. I don't know what her position is on the trade agreement. Just take a position on it. But she, can't, she doesn't know how to take a position for this reason. If she goes out for the trade agreement, the unions go crazy. And if she doesn't go for it, which I'll predict she's going to be against it. It's easy political. How about you? My feeling about it is I'm pretty much for open, but I think the American workers have been shafted. Uh, you know, we got a U.S. steel plant in Ohio. They spent a lot of money building pipes. And what happens? The Koreans come in and they dump all their stuff in America. We don't go aggressively enough against the dumping. So what we do is we crush our own company and crush our own people. I'm for open, but I want to make sure that the workers in this country are protected. Now, that's, that's another thing that creates an enigma for me, because I've never been a total free trader, because I think that the rules ought to apply to other countries like they apply to us. And when we don't do that, it reflects arrogance on the part of Americans. Well, you sound a little bit like Elizabeth Warren, and, um, you know, she... <laughs> on that, and she... 
She's a Democrat who makes the point that Wall Street is uh, getting more than its fair share. And um, you've worked on Wall Street yeah. in, one of your, in one of your incarnations. You yeah. talk about trade in a, in a populist uh, well, no, way. I, I'm, I'm for, look, I voted but, for NAFTA. Right. But I, I think we need to learn, look, but I've are seen, you a little, is there a little bit Elizabeth Warren in you? Uh, no, I don't think any, but uh, <laughs> no, but listen, listen, here's, here's, let me tell you, let me tell you something. I limited the production of the B-2 bomber with Ron Dellums. Ron Dellums was one of the most liberal members of Congress. Of course there's going to be things I agree with on other people. I may, fund, I may disagree with them on nine out of ten issues. Do you so agree what? with her on her read of Wall Street as being too greedy? Oh, I think Wall Street is overwhelmingly too greedy. And I'll tell you what, what there's a, if anybody ever worked on Wall Street, there's this magic term, did you get paid? Okay, did you get paid means what's your bonus? You have people laughing, you've heard the term, okay? Wall Street is important. You ask Eric Schmidt, it matters. But whenever the ticket gets to be more important than the good of the company, then you've lost your moral underpinnings. Now, you know who says that? Michael Novak, AEI, winner of the Templeton Prize Award, d given to him by the Catholic Church, he wrote a book, The Theory of Democratic Capitalism. He says a capitalist system that is not underlaid by a set of values of morality is bankrupt. I agree with that. And when the greed factor, you get the arrow, when it goes to greed, that's bad. But if it's, if it's business and capitalism and free markets with a little bit of a conscience, it's good. So, but I don't think you can fix all this like Elizabeth Warren says by demonizing the rich or saying we can just impose all these regulations. You know, earlier on I talked about capital being the lifeblood. This Dodd-Frank bill went overboard. Now banks won't lend any money. So if you're out there an entrepreneur and you're really hungry to create a business and change the world and healthcare or who knows what it is, you can't get a loan because we've, we've strangled the lending institutions. So everything in this town goes either here or here. This is the old, you know, the old 60 minutes syndrome. I saw it on Sunday, so I put in 10 pieces of legislation on Monday. <laughs> we all need to take a deep breath and realize that we will fix things through, through character on the part of the American citizens and the ability of us to manage many of these things locally rather than here with the machine, the central machine. Okay, I'm gonna ask one last question. Yeah. And um, it is a political question, I know you hate those, but um, <laughs> as I said before- I don't hate them, uh, okay. As I said before, no Republican presidential candidate has ever won without winning the state of Ohio. Your second term governor, if you don't run, would you consider a, a vice presidential slot? Is that something that's on your mind? It's not on my mind. Okay, it's, it's the farthest okay, thing from Okay, answer the mind. first question I asked. Would you consider a vice presidential slot? No, no, why would I be thinking that? That's like saying, I mean, no, the answer is I don't think about that at all. And, and I'm governor of Ohio. It's a fantastic job. So, frankly, it has, I don't have any interest in it. I don't know what they do. What do they do? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what they do. But I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think if I don't do this, I'm going to run out my term. I would never come down here. There might be a couple things that I would consider, but I'm gonna go in and create a business. I love my 10 years in business. It was fantastic and I'm unlikely to be involved, but I wanna keep doing this. I wanna keep talking about these things because I care about them and we'll see. The one good thing about thinking about running for president is I, I get invited to stuff like this so I can talk about what I care about. And um, if I wasn't doing this, I probably would be serving the meal. So. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank Thanks, you, Gloria. Governor. Well, that was fun. It was.